Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show, where we help you make the wisest and most profitable decisions. And today we'll talk about the wisest and most profitable decisions on returning to the office, specifically why so many leaders screw up, botch, make serious mistakes in returning to the office. Why do they do this? How do we prevent it? That's the topic, and we'll focus specifically on the dangerous judgment errors that cause leaders to make bad, bad mistakes in returning to the office. Now, as the basis of this conversation, we need to know what employees actually want in returning to the workplace and permanent post-pandemic work arrangements. We see that overwhelmingly, employees want substantial remote work. Over 75% in lots of surveys, eight major surveys done by organizations like the Harvard Business, school, done by the Society for Human Resources, management, done by Microsoft, done by Slack, many other companies, organizations, show that over 75%, depending on the survey, 75 to 85% want work from home at least half the time, and 25 to 35% want full-time work from home. So that's what employees want. And importantly, minority workers want it even more. So we see that this is a major issue. There was a survey that compared white knowledge workers and black knowledge workers, and about 20% of white knowledge workers wanted to go back to the office Monday for Friday, nine to five. Only 3% of black knowledge workers wanted the same thing because they faced in-office discrimination. Now, the surveys also showed that across the whole population, 40 to 55% indicated that be willing to leave the companies if they're not given their preferred work arrangements. So this is definitely a serious issue, especially in the context of the great resignation, where we're seeing so many employees leave their companies. This is a big, big problem for these companies. And the major companies we've already seen making some big, big mistakes on returning to the office. Companies that are the largest companies in the world, like Google and Amazon, They tried to force all of their employees back to the office. Kind of that was their plan, go back to the office. And they had serious opposition from their employees and many employees resigned. And so Google on May 5th said that, okay, we're realized we screwed up, we need to change our plans and we're going to now allow many of our employees to work full-time remotely. Amazon also changed its plans and announced it changed its plans on June 10th So this is the clear examples where so many employees left. They have faced so much resistance, so much hit, much of a hit to their morale, engagement and productivity that they decided to change their plans. And of course, it cost them many millions of dollars to make the initial wrong plans and then try to fix them. This is something that you don't want to face in your own company. You don't want to follow their bad examples. This is not something you want. So this is a crucial area to remember that not only surveys show, but real life examples of trillion dollar companies show that not listening to employees leads to really bad outcomes. Why then are leaders of Google, of Amazon and many, many other companies not listening to their employees on how much their employees like and appreciate remote work? What's going on? It has to do with what leaders are comfortable with, with their gut reactions, with their intuitions. They tend to trust their heart, follow their gut, and go with what their intuitions say is right. And they had a successful career for 30, 40 years in the office, in office environments. They can have accountability, they can have oversight, they can come and they can see their employees working. They can connect to their employees. Leaders tend to be gregarious and they want to feel connected to their employees. They want to have that social environment. I helped 14 companies transition back to the office, strategically figure out what their transition back to the office and their permanent post-pandemic work arrangements. And I've seen many leaders, spoken to many leaders who say that they're really comfortable, surrounded by employees in the office. It really feels good to them. So this is a personal comfort concern. Leaders want to return to that normal life prior to the pandemic, to January 2020. They want to turn back the clock. They're very comfortable with this in office work. And they also have some organizational concerns. So kind of one side is personal, what they feel comfortable with, what they feel is quote unquote right. And then there are organizational concerns. They're concerned with company culture becoming worse if they have substantial amount, if workers work remotely, a hybrid schedule, 
a substantial amount of the time or even full-time remotely. They are concerned about burnout from work from home. Uh, they're concerned about problems with virtual communication and collaboration, and there's a lack of accountability and oversight that they're concerned about. So those are all concerns that leaders face and that they voice to me. And so the, when I had conversations with 61 leaders at these companies that I helped transition back to the office, these conversations, which is the basis for this podcast episode. And so they told me that these are their concerns. Unfortunately, they're falling into a series of dangerous judgment errors called cognitive biases by going with their gut, by trusting their heart, following their intuition. We're taught that leaders are taught that they should go with their gut, follow their heart and trust their intuition. But this is actually research shows that this is a bad, bad approach to decision making because our gut intuitions very often cause us to make, make bad decisions in new situations especially, but also in old situations. And trust me, returning to the office permanent post-pandemic work arrangements is a new situation. It's as a result of the major disruption of the pandemic. You should not, not, not use the same tools, methods, mentality that you had prior to the pandemic to this new situation. So they, on returning to the office and permanent post-pandemic work arrangements, leaders are making bad decisions, as well as other leadership decisions in this context of recovering from the pandemic, this is a serious major problem. So let's go for these cognitive biases. And there are five cognitive biases that I want to tell you about. Five cognitive biases that are really a big problem. One is called the status quo bias. The status quo bias. Leaders are very comfortable. We all are very comfortable. This applies to all of us, but we're focusing on leaders. We're very comfortable with what feels right, what feels is the case, and that's the status quo, what we are used to. So status quo bias speaks to our desire to maintain the status quo or get back to the status quo, even if doing so harms our interests, harms our goals, undermines whether our personal career, whether our organization, our ability to accomplish our leadership goals. We have a desire to use the same tactics that we did before. We have a desire for the same systems and processes, even if they have bad consequences as a result of us being blind to the major disruptions coming from the pandemic and how people really are different in their preferences and in what they will accept. And many people are leaving because the leaders are trying to get back to the status quo, as we saw from Google, Amazon, and many other companies. So that's a status quo bias. The second cognitive bias I want to share with you about is called the anchoring bias, the anchoring bias. We are anchored to our initial experiences, to our initial information. Leaders who succeeded in their career for 30, 40 years, they came to the workplace and they became successful on it you know, starting in the 1990s, maybe before the digitalization of the workplace. So they're really comfortable and familiar with in-office environments that are not mediated by digital communication. And they perceive that as the right way to be, as the right approach. And they're, of course, the digital revolution has come since then, but they're really seeing it through the lens of their initial in-office experiences. Whereas younger employees had a lot of virtual experience as they grow up more digital environment. You know, people who began their careers in the aughts, you know, and uh, in the new millennium, they had much more of a digital environment as they were growing up. So they're much more comfortable, familiar, and involved in digital activities. And so that explains why the leaders are anchored to their in-office environment and their employees are not, and they would like to do much more remote work. So they're anchored to how work should be done. And that is a big, big problem. The third cognitive bias you need to know about is called the confirmation bias. The confirmation bias. If you've heard about any biases, this is one you've probably heard about. It relates to how we look for information that confirms our beliefs. And then we ignore information that doesn't confirm our beliefs. For example, when I've been observing companies and when I come into companies to help them figure out what's going on, I find that a number of them have not done really surveys of their employees on what they desire. And when I heard from other folks about what, kind of, what, they, what happens in their companies is that the top leader, CEO, talks to her or his direct subordinates, the C-suite, the other chief officers, and then their C-suite talks to their senior VPs, and that's all. And remember, these are all people in their leadership position. So when 
the CEO talks to the C-suite, the C-suite talks to the senior VPs about what they want in returning to the office prevent post-pandemic work arrangements. They all give pretty similar answers about, you know, we want back to in-office culture. That's kind of what we succeeded in. And they don't think about, well, how do we figure out what is actually the desire of the rest of the population in our company? And then what would be the consequence if we try to impose our perspective on them? So they I've done a survey, for example, I've done a survey for a major peer executive. I've done work with a major peer executive group that has many, many thousands of employee of leaders, CEOs in peer executive groups across the world, especially in the United States. And the survey that they did of their leadership showed that their the executives, and this is middle market companies ranging from 50 to 2000 people, the over 50% of the leaders did not do, of these companies did not do surveys of their employees on returning to the workplace, and that is a big problem. So they don't have the hard data, they don't look for it, and they deliberately ignore it if it appears on major damage from forced in-office work, such as these, even if they didn't do their own surveys, such as these major external surveys. So that's a big, big problem. A related problem is called the false consensus effect. The false consensus effect. Leaders tend to believe that others in their companies, in their tribes, in their groups, that they share their preferences, they share their predispositions, they share their desires. And, you know, the CEO might think that, well, even if employees at my company say that they want to stay home full time or, you know, not come in more than one or two days a week. In reality, it's not a strong desire. They'll accept it if I tell them that you must go back to the office. And you know what? That is how Google and Amazon and many other companies that are now reversing their course lost many millions of dollars. I mean, trust me, with this Google company, it's a trillion dollar company, they lost many millions of dollars in top talent leaving. Same thing for Amazon, top talent leaving, hits to morale, and then having to change their plans. You don't want to be in that position. So coming into the office, there's strong beliefs about what their teams want that are not realized. And that's a big problem. Now, the fifth bias that you really want to know about is called functional fixedness. Functional fixedness. That has to do with how we perceive the changing what we're doing in regard to a certain situation. So when we have a certain way of functioning, we perceive it as the only right way to function. It's also expressed in a popular saying about the hammer and the nail. When you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So when you have a certain way of doing in-office work, everything looks like you should do it that, that way. And that especially applies to remote work because in the March 2020 lockdown, companies abruptly transitioned to remote work and they transposed their in-office culture on remote work. And that led to a number of problems where their work, remote work, was not very effective, was not very efficient. They had a lot of problems, hiccups that they shouldn't have had. Things like Zoom happy hours. That's really not a good way of having people bond together. And many, many other problems. They didn't train their people for doing effective virtual communication, virtual collaboration. That's why you're saying things like the poor virtual communication collaboration being complaints. Or work from home burnout. They didn't train their people on how to stay within appropriate hours and guidelines. That's a big problem. So you can solve these problems by adapting to the right way to work in hybrid cultures or in full-time remote work. But companies did not do so because they perceived that there's only one right way of working remotely. So transposing office culture and remote work is a bad idea and failing to adapt strategically to remote work is also a bad idea. So these are the five cognitive biases that cause serious problems for leaders. Now, what leaders need to do and what you need to do to help leaders if you're not a leader yourself, so kind of lead the leaders, lead from below as the phrase goes, to thrive in the post-pandemic workplace, you need to make the best decisions on returning to the office to, and address these cognitive biases as you're doing so. You need to overcome these gut reactions, these intuitions, and you need to go against what's comfortable and help the, your leaders go against what's comfortable for them. Make them aware of these cognitive biases, the status quo bias, anchoring bias, false consensus effect, confirmation bias, functional fixedness, they need to be aware of and address these problems. 
And that is what will help you focus on what you really need to do, not doing what feels right or what intuitively seems to be the case. But you really need to look at what the hard data says about how you will actually optimize for what's critical for an organizational function, retention of your talent, recruitment of top talent, which so many companies are as they're recovering economically from the pandemic, morale of your team members, engagement of your team members, productivity that we know from extensive research that people on average are more productive when they work remotely, especially in their individual tasks. And then of course the company's bottom line based on all that retention, recruitment, morale, engagement, productivity, that all feeds into the company's bottom line. And that is what you need to do to seize competitive advantage in the post pandemic reality. All right, everyone, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. Please click like and please make sure to subscribe if you did like it and please make sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, on YouTube, wherever you check it out. We have both a video cast and a podcast. You can check out both in the show notes. And I would like you to hear your thoughts on what you've enjoyed in this podcast. Please email me at gleb at disasteravoidanceexperts.com. So again, email me at gleb at disasteravoidanceexperts.com with your thoughts on this episode. All right, everyone. I hope again, I hope this episode helps you make the wisest and most profitable decisions. And I hope to see you next time, my friends.